Good morning, River Valley. What a wonderful, beautiful day. It's going to be sunny and bright. And thank you for joining us on this Facebook Live. I want to make a few mentions. The Fishers of Men, that's for our Christian men or any men um, who are interested. Uh, it's going to meet Thursday, July 25th at 6.30 p.m. Um, and was looking for uh, anything else. I don't see any other announcements right now. If you would like to do a gift or tithe offering, uh, you can give online. You can text to 765 200 or you can give by mail to RVCC. 4295 Egbert Road, Martinsville, Indiana, 46151. And we thank you for any and all things that you're able to give to River Valley. We appreciate you. And we appreciate your attendance here. Most of all, thank you so much for joining us for this live broadcast of our sermon today. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Dawn. Good morning, Teresa and Pam. Good morning, let's stand together. Hey, the not flowing yet. Yeah, let's get this song guys done. Let's get into this song. Right away, let's give our heart and our soul. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the people of God sing His praise all over the land, everyone in this valley. Those on the mountains are free back and shout for joy. Rise up and praise Him. He deserves our love. Rise up and praise Him. Just worship the Holy One with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Rise up and praise Him. Let the earth be glad. Let the people of God sing His praise all over the land. Everyone in the valley, come and lift your voice. All those on the mountains are free glad and shout for joy.
People, our God is good. You, you agree? Yes. Yeah. Yes, amen. And uh, we gather together today to worship him and lift him up and bring him our offering of praise this day. So let's do that at, as you already are in such a great way. Thank you for worshiping the Lord the way you are. Let's turn it right on up with our intensity today, with our attention, with our focus, with our heart, soul, mind, strength, might everything that is within us, again, because He is worthy. Amen. Yes, amen. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for joining us online, and uh, let's make this a glorious day for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we worship the Father and the Spirit, and uh, may His will be done this week in our lives as we, we start here today. Let's go to the prayer, and then we're going to continue our prayers. Father, we thank you for this uh, this day that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for your protection, watching out for us. Lord, we lift our nation to you right now. We pray that you might uh, turn down the hatred, the vile rhetoric. Lord, I pray we're better than this. I pray, Lord, that Hearts might be broken and changed this day. And we might be a people that seek your face. You know, there's only one answer to every question and every problem, every dilemma that we face. It's in one name, in the name of Jesus. See? Thank you, Father, that our great battle has already been won on the cross. And that our Savior is triumphant. And we might also be victorious when we're in Him. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Lord, we pray you don't pass us by. Let it start with us. In our neighborhood, in our family, in our acquaintances. Let us love one another. Even as Jesus the Father does. Let it be so, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship. This is what we need to pray for. More love, more power, more God in our lives, right?
and say, please, that's all we need. What a beautiful song. I encourage you to sing along with Daniel on this one. And be encouraged. You are not alone.
He's given us a purpose and a meaning for life. He's given us hope and a future. And His name is Jesus. Lord, thank Amen. You. And worship Him today. Kevin. 
Yes. Yes. Well, I think those up front could hear me. <laughs> We're glad you're here today in every row. There's a notebook. Please grab that, fill your name out there, and leave us some information how to contact you and any prayer request. But I'd also like you to stand up. I'd like you to greet someone around you, say hello, welcome to River Valley, and learn the name of one person you have not yet before. One person. Oh, good morning. And you're here with You guys have been all gone to the same property. You got his stand and he got his stand.
We're going to have some video motivation from Willie uh, Robertson and Kyle Allen about evangelism that the church ought to do to make disciples. There will be on August 3rd, a Saturday night, an all-church movie, The Blind. It is about uh, Phil Robertson, his uh, wild uh, uh, life of a young adult. Uh, he, he was a college student, a quarterback. He, he beat out Terry Bradshaw, uh, well, you know, a great fame of the NFL. And uh, he was quite an athlete, and yet he, he wasn't walking with the Lord. And somebody led him to the Lord in his life, and the story of Duck Dynasty and the Robertson family grew because of the faith in Christ, and the blind portrays uh, that conversion. Friend Day will follow on August 4th. We'll have a meal after church. Uh, we're going to be working for uh, the next few weeks to uh, have children uh, sing DBS songs. And then on that fourth present then, uh, we're going to have uh, August 8th a uh, simulcast here at the church. That is a Friday at noon. And we'll videotape it so we can show it again later. The Willie Robinson will present a creating a culture of evangelism, practical steps for effective outreach through Right Now Media, which we, we have as a tool of teaching in our church. So if you can, mark your calendar for August 8th, 12 noon. We'll gather all who can be here for that, that presentation. We'll try to videotape it and share it again. And then August 11th, we'll have an outreach class. We will begin once a month to uh, do some things dynamically together as a church in outreach month by month. And on that August 11th, we'll have a guest speaker, Jesse Pryor, a uh, missionary to Papua New Guinea that we do support. So we are thinking that we ought to obey Christ who say, go into all the world, preach the gospel, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And so we, we've got to preach the gospel. We've got to present the gospel. We've got to go with the gospel. And when people hear, faith grows. And so that's the battle plan. We, we, we do that. So many of you are doing that already individually. But we're going to try to band ourselves together in such a way, you know, week by week, how we can do something together and uh, maybe in unison multiply the number of those who become followers of Jesus. There is a need for a battle plan because there is a battle that is going on in our world. Amen. Last week we looked at Ephesians 6 and we started in that chapter learning about walking in grace and growing in love. And doesn't our world need both of that today? Amen. Amen. If we continue on from where we uh, looked at last week, I want you to look at verse 10 of chapter 6. Finally, he's at the end of his writing of this letter. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. So he's written about the life we ought to live in the world, and he says, put on the full armor of God. And what's required, required is take a stand against the devil. Wayne Smith, a great preacher of days gone by, used to tell this story. It was about a boxer who uh, uh, was getting beat up in nearly every round. He could barely drag himself back to the corner when he got to the corner. This trainer kept telling him, go out there. You go get him. He hasn't laid a hand on him. On you. Round after round, he'd go out and fight and come back weary, and the trainer would say the same thing. Round after round, he would get the beating. He'd come back to the corner, and the trainer would say, Go ahead, get out there. He has a way to dove on you. When the final ring of the bell, uh, for the last ring of the bell, for the final round came, the boxer finally said to his friend, I'm going to go out there for this round. I'm going to go get him. But I want you to keep your eye on the referee because somebody in the ring has beaten the devil out of me. 
Do you realize that uh, we are fighting against some unseen forces? A man once observed sicknesses that invade our body are tied to viruses and bacteria. You can't see them, but we know they're there. And a doctor will advise you to be on guard and to battle against it. And so it is in the real world with Satan. You can't see, but Paul reminds the church, the believers in Christ, we're in this ring of life, and someone's beating you up, but it isn't God. It is a formidable adversary, and his name is Satan. C.S. Lewis put it this way, when it comes to Satan, people usually fall into one of two kinds of errors. We either take Satan all too seriously or we take him not serious enough. And certainly when you think about Satan and the the idea of him in the world, if you're as sophisticated as some of our, our world are, you, 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 you just almost can't even believe there is a devil. Who could believe in a man dressed in red with a goatee, a tail, and a pitchfork? You see, I think when we try to de display and describe Satan in such imagery, we get to a point we ridicule his image and we can almost think, well, maybe that kind of fellow doesn't even exist. But the same people who would deny the existence of the devil will scratch their head when the evidence of evil rises in the world. What possesses a man to take a rifle and shoot a presidential candidate yesterday? Amen. Why is there so much hatred in the world? Why is there violence that comes against people of Israel? I don't know what you believe, but I believe there is a source behind all the name. And Jesus himself believed in the devil. John 10.10 10 says... Jesus speaking, Satan is a thief. He came to steal, kill, and destroy, and he is the father of all lies. Jesus fought a battle, not only against Satan, but the evil forces of our world. And Satan's been around a long time. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3, and you're going to get an introduction to Genesis in those opening pages of creation. Look what it says of Satan in verse 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. So Satan existed at the time of creation, and he was more crafty than any of God's creation. And then it says, Satan said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. She clearly heard God's instruction, his voice. But when Satan began to confront her, his first introduction was to get folks to focus on the one thing God tells you to do. Why couldn't Eve just obey God? Why couldn't she just resist this temptation at the outset of creation? Why couldn't she not eat of the tree in the middle of the garden? I heard it said one side. Time up. Do you know why God created poison ivy? The answer is he wanted to teach mankind there are some things you keep your cotton picking hands off of. <laughs> there are some things God knows best you ought not participate in. And at the outset there was a beautiful paradise. I heard one preacher said there was abundance all around, but in the middle of the garden, there was one tree they couldn't eat. They passed all the abundance to go to the forbidden fruit. Why couldn't she keep her hands off the fruit? It was because Satan had a scheme. She had never seen it before, and she fell for it. 
Satan's first attack on mankind was to get you to question God's word. Oh, God didn't really say that. Did he really mean that? And he, he tried to get her to deny God's word. Then he reverses God's word. Look at verses 4 and 5. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God. You will know good from evil. And so Satan is having schemes by, behind the scene. And God gave us free will. Adam and Eve fell has God ever said to you, and you know it's from the Word of God, that sex is reserved for marriage? But have you heard someone from the word, world seeing or say in consultation, marriage is boring, why don't you spice up your life? Or how many of you have ever heard the lyrics of a tune, it can't be wrong if it feels so right? That's a scheme of the devil. As God said to you, you're going to give 10% of your hard-earned money to the, the Lord's work, and He will be, bless you. But at the same time, have you heard somebody that you may respect or, that says, uh, that's not true, just treat yourself, live the good life, and that'll be enough. Has God ever said to you, you forgive the person that hurt you so badly, and yet immediately the thought comes across your mind, I, I, I'm not going to forgive and I'm not going to forget. I'm going to get even if it's the last thing I do. But where do those thoughts come from? It's not of God. It's a scheme of the devil. When the woman saw the fruit, she saw it was good for food and pleasing to the eye. And Satan tricked her. Listen to the voice. The Bible says it was also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. And look carefully in verse 6. She also gave it to her poor defenseless husband who was with her and he ate. Now that really wasn't in there, but a lot of it. And verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. <clears throat> Aha, I do know good from evil, but I'm going to hide from God. Have you ever noticed that just like Adam and Eve, when we reject what God says, we seldom feel better, we feel exposed, we try to cover up, and we'll even try to hide from God. Paul is telling his brothers and sisters of Christ at the end of this letter, we're in a real battle in this world. And it's not a battle with flesh and blood that you can see. It's against rulers and authorities and powers of this world. There are schemes behind the scene that are attacking you. You better be ready. And folks, when the day of evil begins, you better be like the soldier who grabs the armor of God and heads for the fight. If not us, others may suffer. Some of you know that Jamie used to work in Tamarack, Florida at Community Christian Church there in the Fort Lauderdale area. But that church building was only like three miles away from the Parkland, Florida High School, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And you know what took place there. Some of the kids that were there who were attacked and shot and injured and others who weren't injured went to that school, also attended that church. Bullets ricocheted, bodies fell in that high school. And it was mayhem when somebody took on a scheme of the devil to attack innocents in that high school. There was a deputy by the name of Scott Peterson who was outside the building, but instead of storming and firing against the 19-year-old gunman, he retreated to a position of safety, although he had every piece of the equipment to stop the mayhem. And he didn't save many lives. 
Paul reminds us that there is an enemy in our world and we need to be wise. We need to speak the truth in love, but we need to get ready for battle and we need to put on the full armor of God. Not only for ourselves, but for those around us who will perish if the enemy succeeds. We too must put on the equipment God has provided and then we must race toward the conflict. We've got to have a battle plan to, to try to defeat the enemy in the world today. Let's move on and see what is required to be strong in the Lord. Number two, put on the full armor of God. You've got to wear the right gear for this battle. Verse 11, Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. What he's saying is you, you need to put on this armor of God. Wear it in the battle. Uh, it's kind of like, the, uh, I know Will Ball is uh, preparing for football this year. Uh, Will 6'3", and he wears this, this uh, football helmet and the shoulder pads and, and, the, and, and the, 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 the thing that protects the, the shoulder pad, protects his breath, uh, his heart, and, and he's, he just looks like a warrior when he's out there. you got to give your young people in that sport the right equipment to succeed. Uh, yesterday, I, I saw Will uh, out mowing the yard. If you come to the church and you see the yard is mowed well up near the building, uh, we, we don't have the best equipment for him to mow. You ought to see six foot three Will on that little craftsman on mower mowing that yard at, at a snail's pace. It looks good, but it's not the right equipment to be effective and cover a whole property. And behind the scenes, uh, the leaders are working to improve the equipment for a better result of a soldier or warrior ready to work. If you don't have the right gear, you need to get it, you need to put it on because there's a battle to be won. Satan will take advantage if we're not protected. What do we need to wear? Look at verses, I believe, 14 and following. There's a battle we've got to wear the right to clothing. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around the waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Verse 15. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the, sh the shield of faith with which you can experience, uh, extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so he itemizes what our godly uh, armor is. Look at it. The belt of truth is needed. Surrounding us must be truth. Truth comes from God. We, we, we told kids to be yes. Truth comes from God. They sang the song. They learned of that truth. That truth, truth comes from God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We, we surround ourselves in our most innermost being with truth. And if people can't trust us, then the representation of Christ dies to the lives of the world. Secondly, there's a breastplate of righteousness. It is much like the footballer's shoulder pads or the policeman's bulletproof vest. You need that, that protection across your heart to protect your heart from the onslaught of the evil one. If any representative of Christ fails to conduct his life with righteousness, we fail to advance in the battle. We've got to do what is right in God's sight. That's what righteousness is. If we know his truth, we've got to do what he says right in his son. People, their biggest argument against the church is they're just a bunch of hypocrites. We've got to work to be consistent that we know his truth and we live our life that matches the word. And people need to see us as authentic and genuine and in heartfelt obedience to Christ. And right is always right if nobody's doing it. And wrong is always wrong even if everyone is doing it. Be right in God's sight. Next, choose 
the shoes of readiness. What are you wearing today? Well, when you put on shoes, you, you wear them so you can comfortably go and spread the gospel. How beautiful are those, the feet of those who carry good news. It's, it's kind of like a fireman whose boots are ready to hop in when the fire alarm comes. We've got to be ready when the opportunity knocks. Now, just some quick examples of uh, of the kind of shoes of readiness we have. And Kirsten uh, Conway leads our children's program. Every now and then there, there are those who are assigned it cannot help and she'll frantically call some. Can you uh, substitute this week? There is the new son who would sacrifice this time of being taught in here to go teach the youth of our next generation with the gospel of peace. Are you ready? There is also in our church from time to time death that occurs and some family member is hurting with grief. And, and the ministry that we offer to, to almost every family is that after the uh, uh, service of the celebration of life or a graveside service, would, would you let us feed you some food for your family to gather afterwards? And that takes some work. It, it takes some ladies to say, yes, I'll lead that project. It'll take some ladies and men to contribute and cook for that project. It'll take some ladies and men to stay after that event to clean up after that project. But the power of ministry to people who are hurting is so valuable. We've got to have people on a moment's notice to, to be ready with the gospel to share in that time of need. And of course, there is no better example than what we did with Fair Parking and Bill Gross and his leadership. Bill, Bill was telling me last night he thought we had 34 or 35 different adults contribute to those eight-hour days, eight nights. What an outstanding testimony. And it wasn't easy. It was hot work. Yes. And Bill was there almost every hour, I believe, every hour. What a great testimony. See, ready with the gospel. Now, we, we had to share some pleasantries with the world that wasn't uh, ready to accept some of the boundaries that the, the fair board asked us to, to impose on different vehicles or, or the cost of the night and who should pay. But we go, we're ready. Uh, years ago, I was taught a children's course. Do you know old Christian here? Sermon and shoes. Do you know, old Christian, your sermon and shoes? Jesus counts upon you to spread the gospel news. So walk it and talk it. Your sermon and shoes. Are your feet ready to go with the gospel of peace? And do you have the shield of faith? We, we have faith that protects us. It gives us an unshakable trust in trying times. Remember when David stood before Goliath? He, he put on an armor that uh, Saul, King Saul, who was really big. And, uh, uh, David was probably a teenager. It, it just didn't fit. So instead he took what God had trained him with, was a slingshot and five stones. And then he went to confront Goliath. And when David stood before Goliath, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down. Do you see what he had surrounded himself with and what he put up? He, he had faith his God was going to protect him. And, and he went with only the sling. And one stone was all he needed. We try to prepare our youth to growing up here with scripture verses that help them. Kids that do sleep, that we teach them Philippians 4, 13. Anybody know that by heart? Amen. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but when the elders tried to determine a code to put on the security uh, way to set the alarm or de-arm the alarm, we, we tried to figure out the code that, that we could all remember. And we used Philippians 4.13, P14, 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 
低，我我一对，啊，我们再来一对。And it comes from Philippians 4:13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He's our protection here. See, it's so good protection. I can't even remember it until I'm under stress. We know where our power is. It's not in us. It's not in us. I can do all things through Christ to give me strength. The helmet of salvation. One of the peace that we have is when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We have you know, just a protection that they, they guards our. Hearts and thoughts in our mind. In just a little bit, today, we're going to have a baptism into Christ. And, and last Lord's Day, Ruth Ann Coy came forward with her brother. And she made her confession of Christ, and she set this day to be baptized. And, and she uh, has proclaimed Christ as Lord. And now she is going to uh, be buried with Christ to be raised in His likeness. Uh, we believe she will gain forgiveness of sin and a rightness with God and a peace that passes understanding. This salvation gives her a peace and a comfort that passes understanding. And then, Ruth Ann, you need to join us in this battle against this unseen force to another level. You see, we pick up the helmet of salvation, we put it on and we try to do a, a noble service to advance the kingdom of God. I've always liked what C.T. Stead used to say, someone to live within the sound of church or chapel bell, but I want to, want to run a rescue shop within a yard bell. Some people will be so confident in their faith that they'll go to the front of the battle where Satan is attacking. I, I, I applauded the my daughter Kendra, when she went to Haiti, do you understand how difficult Haiti is to minister to orphans? I, I, I'm so proud of my niece, Terry, and her husband, Jesse, who's going to preach on August 11th. They're in Papua New Guinea. They're, they're working with bush people, folks, primitive people. They're, they're within a yard of hell trying to get those folks to know about Christ. They do that because they have peace, they're saved, and they know other people need it too. And that's our ministry in Martinsville. With this count of salvation, we can confidently walk in our world and just believe greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. And then last, we need the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the only tool that is an offensive tool. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In uh, DBS, we almost always uh, lead the kids to pledges of the American flag, the Christian flag, and then to the Bible. Some of you may remember the pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Its words will I hide in my heart that I might not sin against God. You see, the Bible is the truth. It comes from God. And if it's in our heart, it can be used to conquer Satan. Amen. Do you, do you remember when Jesus was tempted? He, he did battles with Satan right after his baptism. Ruth Ann, you may have battles that you just never know are coming out of the blue by some unseen forces. I believe it will not be of God, but it will be from the evil one. When Jesus was tempted, he, he was told, you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. What did he do? He quoted scripture. Man does not live by the word, uh, bread alone, but by the word of God. For every temptation, he had a scripture, and the scripture protected him from the temptation and the scheme of the devil. Folks, we need to know God's word so well that we will not sin against God. Would you today put on the belt of truth? Would you use this sword of the spirit to advance the kingdom? Put on the full armor of God, and it says you will win the battle against Satan. 
but then it gives one last challenge for the church. There is a power to call on in the midst of the battle against the unseen force. Verse 18. Here's what we need the church need to do more. We do it pretty well, but we've got to do it more. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. The psalmist wrote, when I was in distress, I sought the Lord. And I think that's what we do. When we get to a point of trouble, what do we do? We call on the Lord, or we call on the preacher, or we call on the church. Or we call on God to come to our rescue. How many of you remember when you were in high school and when the teacher would say, I've got a pop quiz. How many of you pray, oh Lord, please come quickly. <laughs> How many of us as adults uh, have different issues with our bodies and we maybe discover a strange lump uh, and you immediately pray, oh Lord, please don't let it be cancerous. Give me strength to trust you in this time. And you ought to call on the Lord. You ought to call on the preacher. You ought to call on the church. You ought to call on your friends in Christ. Folks, when the employer says, I'd like to meet with you tomorrow at 11 a.m., uh, your first thing is probably pray, Lord, please keep my job secure. You should pray. James wrote, is any of you in trouble? He should pray, James 5.13. Now, you probably are sitting there thinking, uh, I think it's pretty natural when we've got a problem, we pray. But there's a whole world of folks all around us. That is not the first thing they do. In fact, a lot of people don't turn to God even in the midst of a great crisis. Federal aviation inspectors say that when they listen to the final words of airline pilots just before it crash, they frequently hear profanity the very last words recorded on uh, tape preserved in the black box are often not prayers, but profanity to God. There's a world that doesn't get on their knees and ask God for help. And I think today we ought to be able to get on our knees and ask God for help for this nation. One of the reasons the United States has been so blessed is because in times of trouble, our leaders have called on God and turned us to prayer. Think about some of our history. The, the pilgrims barely survived the first winter in the new land. They prayed that God would provide, and he did. And they made it through that first winter, and our nation was soon thereafter birthed. George Washington knelt in the snow of Valley Forge, asked God for the resources so the Revolutionary Army could survive. He did, and the U.S. prevailed. Abraham Lincoln, perhaps one of the greatest presidents of our time, said, I have been driven to my knees many times by the overwhelming conviction that I had no other place to go. My own wisdom and that of those around me seemed insufficient for the day. And how much more today? Where could I go but to the Lord? D.O. Moody says every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. And the church needs to be leading the way. For the church to overcome in this battle of our world, we have got to pray. And today I'm asking the church, will you pray with me for this church, this preacher, this nation? And the work of outreach we need to do in the name of Christ. Would you, would you say amen? Amen. Verse 18 says, pray in the spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep praying on for all of the Lord's people. Verse 19, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Wherever we go, whatever day of the week it is, we need to share the message of Christ with someone. Pray for this church. Pray for your preacher. Pray for the leaders of this church. Pray for the outreach we're planning in weeks to come. Pray for the battle against the unseen forces that we won't win without the power of God. 
And today, I'm just going to ask at our invitation time for you to join me in prayer. Praise Him if you want to come. Please go ahead and come. Every Lord's Day, we always uh, preach Christ, and we pray that from preaching the gospel of Christ, Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, the crucified Lord, the buried Lord, the risen Lord. We have an ascended Lord and a returning Lord one day. If you kind of know that message, you believe that truth, but you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we offer that message to you that you might hear and believe. Upon your faith in Jesus, would you respond by faith with turning to God, with uh, calling on His name, turning to Him, asking for forgiveness? Repentance is to be preached in His name to all nations. we got to start here. Would you also be willing to confess Christ? Speak with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, because you believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead. Paul says, if you do that, you'll be saved. And after the resurrection, our Lord said, go preach this gospel to all of the world, to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Upon your faith in Jesus, would you be baptized? The baptistry is ready today. It's warm. It's ready to go. In just a little bit, Ruth Ann will share in that act of faith. And God will bless her with the promises of forgiveness and sin. The, the gift of the Holy Spirit that will get her strength for this battle. And she'll, she'll be a part of the family of God that, that openly declares allegiance to Christ. We invite you to accept Christ. Maybe you're saved. You're, you've done all the things by faith here. Believe, repent, confess, be baptized. But you just don't have a home church. We, we offer Christ to you and this church to you to be partners to walk in the world in this battle together. We can't do it alone. Bill couldn't do parking alone. He needs 35 or more. Next year, we don't need more. We need you. You need us and you need God. If you need a home church, all we ask is if you have heard, if you have believed, if you have repented, confessed, or been baptized, would you just declare your faith in Christ with a confession? We'll welcome you in partnership with the church. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father in heaven. And it's upon that confession we welcome you in partnership. But I also know in this church family, we've sent out this week so many people that have prayer issues that uh, our bodies have been attacked. I don't think the attack is from God. I think it's from Satan. And James taught the church, if any of you are sick, call the elders. So I don't like our elders to come forward even right now. I like our elders who are here today to stand right up front. And I want them to be ready to welcome you if you would come for prayer. Would you come if you have a prayer concern of health or relationship or finances? Um, a prayer for family who need to know the Lord? I don't know what you have on your heart. And all of us should be praying for our nation. If you want to come up front and have these men lead you and us together in prayer, I, I'd ask you to just come down and let's pray. Please stand with me right now. Let's sing our hymn of decision. It's an invitation to prayer to call on God. And let's let the prayers of the Spirit lead us even now. May our singing a song of praise of the Spirit to God. If you want prayers, would you please come? Oh, 
Father God, we praise your holy name. We thank you for all the many blessings that you have afforded us here on this uh, earth. We love you. We know that these blessings come from you. We know that there are blessings that we can't even see that we should be thankful for, and we are. For these who are mentioned today, Annie Clark and Will and Jim and the others who are on the prayer list, Father, we ask that you touch them in a spiritual way, in a physical way, that they might be comforted, that they might be healed, and that they might experience your holy power that is available to all of us by just getting on our knees. We love you so much, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Go ahead and return to your seat, and we'll observe the Lord's Supper together. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. As we uh, are we on? As we uh, get our hearts set to partake the Lord's Supper, uh, an interesting thing I learned about a piece of the armor that we have that Kevin mentioned. We, we take up the shield of faith, and at that time. Paul was modeling, you know, the Roman soldier he would have looked at to talk about this armor. Uh, they typically carried a shield in battle that was about two feet wide by about four feet tall, very greatly, but on average that. And Roman soldiers would do this formation in battle called the phalanx or the turtle. It's kind of a human tank. They would link their shields together. They even had uh, notches, if I understand it correctly, where those those shields were linked together. You can imagine several soldiers tied together with those shields, and some would even up on top put their shields that way, walk right up to a, a city wall or a rampart or whatever, and, and then disperse and fight, and that way they could get in close. Shield of faith. I wonder why he chose that. Well, some have said that, like the Roman soldiers did, <coughs> We link our faith together. My faith helps your faith when yours is weak. Your faith helps my faith when it's flickering, maybe about to go out. Amen. What a beautiful uh, way to look at that. And I think that's what happens when we come together for communion, as we call it, the Lord's Supper. It's easy to say, you can do communion on your own if circumstances find you that way, I think. Nothing wrong with that. But in general, it's thought of that when we come together the first day of the week, we break bread and partake of the Lord's Supper together. And uh, link our shields of faith in a declaration that we believe Jesus is Christ. He's the Son of God, and all our hope is in Him. But you know, when we get out there on our own, and we're in this armor, even Christians that you might think, he's, he's like a, a super Christian, he's like a mighty Christian, he's foul. He's just surrounded in valor, or she's just amazing. Don't ever think that those Christians don't uh, don't feel like Peter did. You know, he drew a sword, ready to defend Jesus, he even cut off Malchus's ear, and Jesus restored it. This man that drew a sword, ready to defend Jesus, just moments later was denied him three times. We remember, even though men, especially, there's not a man in here that doesn't want to be known as a strong man. I think women too, maybe in a different way, but nobody really wants to be known as weak, do they? But we are weak, aren't we? We're weak in the face of Satan. We have no power to face his mighty power. But we have one who has, is, we are in one who has greater power. And uh, I'm just reminded, when you have that bad week, that week when you've, even when you've taken up the armor of God, but inside that armor, you're crying, you're hurting, you're lonely, you're scared. And maybe like the prophet Elijah, you're wondering, this is it. I'm the only one left. Let me read these words too, just before we pray and partake. That Twyla Paris, a great singer uh, a few years back, 
So you go to a song called The Warrior is a Child. Let me just encourage you, before we partake of the Lord's Supper, remember whose we are and whom we find our strength and in that we need to encourage one another as we come together with that shield of faith. So lately I've been winning battles left and right. But even winners can get wounded in the fight. People say that I'm amazing, strong beyond my years. But they don't see inside of me. I'm hiding on my tears. Mm. The chorus says, they don't know that I go running home when I fall down. They don't know who picks me up when no one is around. <coughs> I drop my sword and cry for just a while, because deep inside this armor, the warrior is a child. Unafraid because his armor is the best, but even soldiers need a quiet place to rest. So we'll be right here in it. People say that I'm amazing, never face retreat, but they don't see the enemies that lay me at his feet, because they don't know that I go running home when I fall down. They don't know who picks me up when no one is around. I drop my sword and look up for a smile because deep inside this armor, deep inside this armor, deep inside this armor, the warrior is a child. Anyone relate to that today? <laughs> yeah. I think we all can. As we, got, as we gather here around the table, figuratively, let's partake of the Lord's Supper today, remembering Christ. Remembering the, as we partake of the loaf, the cup, the symbols of his body and his bread, that the Lamb of God went to a place of crucifixion for us. And though he could have defeated those mere nails, that cross of wood, it was created through him, even. He allowed himself to die there for you and me. He was fighting the battle. He was our champion. Winning the victory through what seemed like defeat. In that beautiful irony, that place that looked like defeat, our greatest victory was won, the cross. Let's remember Christ as we partake today. And let us, as we partake as a body, link our shields of faith together be strengthened for a week to go out and fight the battle. A battle we fight with love and compassion and tenderness and sacrifice and giving. Let's do it on your faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as our commander in chief in this great struggle against not flesh and blood but the forces of evil in heavenly places. We pray, Father, that uh, we might remember from whom our strength comes. We might, as the psalmist said, look to the hills, to look to you, to look deep into your eyes, and that you might look in our hearts and, and make us what you want us to be, Lord, and remind us that we are yours. We do not need to succumb to the evil one. We do not need to, in pity, think that we have been forsaken, but we have a faithful God a faithful defender, one who is true, one that we can count on. And even when the battle seems the darkest, you are there, Lord. We have that promise. You will never leave us or forsake us. Oh, what great words, Lord. Thank you for loving us even when we're unlovable. Thank you for bolstering up even when we feel the pressure to fear. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity and the incredible privilege to tell others that Jesus is Lord. May we do that as we go out this week. Bless this love, bless this cup. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
please give me just a moment while I transport the camera. Her to be baptized. Uh, her brother, Greg, uh, is a faithful member of the River Valley. She wants him to share in this uh, sacred and special moment. Uh, again, we do this on the teaching of none other than Jesus. We say, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's a birth in Christ. Uh, we follow that up with teaching all that Jesus commanded. Uh, her life from this board, we would encourage her to study all the teachings of Christ. But she comes today to uh, make this a public decision. Jesus said, go into all the world. Preach the good news. Whoever believes and is baptized will be set. Ruth Ann, would you once again uh, speak the great confession? I believe. I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. I want him as my Lord and Savior. I want him as my Lord and Savior. God bless you with that confession of faith. Great you have a word to share with John. I'm very proud of uh, the rest of my family here reach out to uh, all of us and pray that she said, take him by the Holy Spirit and guide him down her way. It's upon your confession of faith in Jesus you are now be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> closer to you. May we uh, leave this place on our knees, seeking your will, your word, your word. Uh, give us wisdom in what to say to our world. Uh, may we be wise that behind the scenes there's an unseen force that we're at. Father, protect us. Uh, may we trust you. Use us in your service. It is in Jesus' name I pray and all his people say. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We are so blessed by your participation with us. We would love if you would come and worship with us side by side next week here in the building. Service starts at 10 a.m. But if for any reason you cannot get here in person, please log back on to this Facebook Live. One way or another, we will be so blessed to see you next Sunday and have a blessed week.